Ebone McDonald, who uh, played football at Oklahoma State University, but also served with distinction with Patton's Third Army and General Patton uh, in North Africa and throughout Europe. And without saying any more, he has some great stories for us about his service and his, and, uh, his dedication to the United States and the United States Army. I'd like to introduce T-Bone. I'll be quite honest with you. This is as distinguished a group of Oklahoma citizens that I've ever seen in one room all at the same time. <laughs> and I'm really glad that Beverly invited me to come down here and do my best. And being the tender age of 86, while I live on top of the highest hill, according to the Santa Fe Railroad, with a topographical map between Chicago and the Gulf of Mexico. And I had so much ice on it this morning that my trash can and my plastic back basket has all the goodies and it's still up there. I wouldn't take it down there for a billion dollars. <laughs> but I think the first thing that happens to a man when he's 86 years old is the equilibrium goes someplace. Now, I don't know where it goes to, but it leaves. and. When I was with General Patton during the Battle of the Bulge, I learned one thing I fear is plain old cold ice. During the Battle of the Bulge, we was up there in Luxembourg and Belgium, around Bastogne most of the time. I read and heard from men in the Third Army that our average temperature and they said this for fact, and I believe them. For four months, the entire time the Battle of the Balls really lasted was 60 below zero. And I found out this old broom corn Johnny from the state of Oklahoma, I didn't like anything unless it was 60 above zero. <laughs> I never did let those hot summers we had back in my youth bother me. Always thought they were wonderful. The way I got involved with General Patton was, I was going to Oklahoma A&M. I was in ROTC, majoring in agricultural economics, which is common sense made difficult. I figured that was the safest thing I could get. <laughs> I figured that was the closest thing I could get involved with. And lo and behold, they got me an ROTC because you had to take it your first two years, freshman and sophomore. They got, had, gave me an ROTC uniform, put it on. I've always said Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a whole lot smarter than people gave him credit for. But I think he knew what was coming. And all of a sudden, an ROTC for the first time in history, we started having an hour class on Tuesday, an hour class on Friday. On Thursday, we'd go out from one to five, which in college is almost unheard of. And we were combat infantry, and our engineering students were combat engineers. And we had an old captain that was about five foot five, proved that dynamite comes in small packages that had served with General Patton and General Pershing in World War I over in Europe. And he taught us an awful lot about the service and knew about combat and things like that. One morning, one of the boys at breakfast, the place where I lived, he said, Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. I said, where'd you hear that? Of course, the TV had been invented. He said, well, T-Bone, he said, I was listening to the radio last night, and they told me the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I took offense to it. 
It was about six in the morning. I put on my old TC uniform, went down to Sixth Street there in Stillwater, stuck out my thumb. Elderly farmer and his wife came by in a pickup. They stopped. They said, Soldier, where are you going? I said, Sir, I'm not a soldier. I said, I'm an ROTC student. He said, I don't care. He said, I got a sneaking idea where you're going. Where are you going? I said, Well, I'm hitchhiking down to Fort Sale to enlist in the Army. That's what I think was the best deal. He told his mama, he said, Nah, baby, he said, scoot over. We got a passenger. To show you how native born Oklahomans are, they took me to Fort Sale. They ride around there while I got who, what, where, when, why, and how much taken care of. And then they brought me home. And the reason they didn't keep me right then, they put me in the Army. But I wore a 14 and a half D combat boot. <laughs> and they had a rule in the United States Army at that time that anybody who wore a 14 and a half D couldn't go overseas unless the supply sergeant had four pairs of combat boots for him because they're hard to replace. So I went back to Oklahoma A&M and finished up the year. And the Army was keeping their eye on me. They knew what was going on. And I really sincerely believe that the main thing, reason that they sent me home was we most assuredly were not prepared for World War II under any circumstances. And every time that the United States wins a war, they send everybody home and start all over again. But our presidents and our chiefs of staff and the people that we give the jobs to must know what they're doing because it never has hurt us. We always come out on the place where the citizens of the United States want us to be, number one. And we did it in number two, World War number two also. One little gem I picked up this morning, I was watching TV early, about 6 o'clock this morning, and lo and behold, they showed the man on TV that's the last surviving veteran of World War I. He's 109 years old, and I'll put him in my group. He looks like he's 109 going on 14. He is superb. That was amazing. The last one, think of that. We sent millions of men overseas in World War I. He's the last one alive. <laughs>